Unit 7. Test 2. Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. In section 1, you will listen to an interview about the homestay program between a coordinator and three students. As you listen, Fill in the missing information in the chart. If a student's experience in the first home stay is positive and very good, make two ticks. If it's OK, make one tick. If it's not good and there are negative feelings, make a cross. Look at the example and questions 1 to 8. Now you will hear the interview for section 1 and fill in the form as you listen because you will hear the recording once only. First, have another look at questions 1 to 8. Now you will hear the interview. Listen carefully and fill in the form. Hi, Fumi. Come in. How are things? OK. Hi, Linda and Ali. How are you? Fine, thanks. Well, as I explained on the telephone, I'm a coordinator of the homestay programme here at the Student Services section of the university and I'm doing a survey on host families to help me draw up a guide for new students. So I'd be grateful if you could tell me about your own experience on the homestay programme. Right. Good idea. Now, Fumi, let's start with you, OK? How long have you been staying with your host family? It's about three months now since I came from Japan. What do you like about your host family? Oh, they are very nice to me and give me freedom to do what I want. I feel quite safe there, just like at home. Do you like the food there? Yes, I love Canadian food. I always want to try new things. It sounds good. Is your experience a positive one for the homestay program? Yes, I think this homestay program is very good and it really provides an opportunity for cultural exchange between Canadians and international students. Thank you, Fumi. Uh, we'll come back to you in a minute. Linda, I'd like to ask you some questions. You have been here for about a year and a half, is that right? Actually, it's about two years since I left Beijing in 2003. What do you think about the program? The homestay program? The program itself is quite good, but it really depends on the individual host family. My first host family was quite a nice family, especially the first two weeks. They took me to the bank, shopping center, it did many things for me, but I had a problem later. What was the problem? My biggest problem was the food. It was awful. They provided me with sandwiches for breakfast and lunch, and they liked to eat raw vegetables and not fully cooked meat for supper. I was not used to their food, and sometimes I felt sick. I had stomach problems for quite a long time. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. So, after three months, I moved out, and now I live with two other students in a student house. Well, Linda, if the food was changed to what you like, would you stay in that family? Sure, I would. I see. What about you, Ali? You come from Japan? No, I come from Korea. I'm sorry. 
Ali, how long have you been in Canada? About eight months. Do you enjoy staying here? Yes, it's a nice place and a very good college. What do you think about the homestay program? I quite agree with Linda. The program is good. The host family is different, and if you're lucky, you may get a good one. But the first one I stayed with was really terrible. Ah,、oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Could you tell me a little more about it? Yes, my first host parents seemed very busy. They usually came back home at about ten in the evening, so I would be hungry until they came back. Did they leave some food for you、uh, when they came back late? No, never. They didn't. They didn't allow me to cook in the kitchen, which was a house rule. That's odd.、Uh, what about your room? Was it comfortable? No, it wasn't. I'd say it was awful. Their dogs often slept in my bed. I complained quite a bit about the dogs, but they weren't sorry that the dogs were in my room because my room used to be their dogs' room. I'm very sorry to hear that. Did you tell this to anyone in the office? Yes, I did. So I was moved out and changed to the host family where I stay now. Are you happy with the new host family now? Yes, I'm very happy now. They're nice and very considerate, and often help me with my homework. How about the food? It's good and often served on time. Good for you. Thank you very much. That's the end of section one. You will have thirty seconds to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. In this section, you will hear a conversation between two students. As you listen to the conversation, fill in the gaps numbered nine to fifteen, and answer questions sixteen to twenty by writing a T if the information is true, an F if the information is false, and an N. If the information is not given, first look at questions nine to twenty. Now listen to the conversation and do questions nine to twenty. Hi, Marty. What did you think of the lecture? It was really good. I enjoyed it very much. By the way, how are you doing with your European Studies tutorial paper? Oh, good. I've just finished it actually. I need to do something different tonight. What are you doing tonight? Would you like to go out with me? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I have to work late tonight. What for? Well, I have to finish my paper and prepare my presentation for tomorrow. Ah, I see.、Uh, what's your presentation topic? Well, after some consideration, I decided to talk about Napoleon. Oh, that's an interesting topic. Napoleon is one of my favourite characters too.、Uh, have you got time for a cup of coffee? Can you tell me about it as a sort of practice? That would be great. Now tell me about Napoleon. I know he used to be a French soldier, and very quickly he became Emperor of France. Do you know when he was born? Yes, he was born in 1769 on the island of Corsica, and when he was only ten years old, his father sent him to a military school in France. Was he a brilliant student at school? No, he wasn't, but he excelled in mathematics and military science. And then, when he was sixteen years old, he joined the French army. Oh, I didn't know he joined the army that young. His military career brought him fame, power, and riches, but finally defeat. 
Napoleon became a general in the French army at the age of 24. Several years later, he became emperor of the French Empire. Do you know when he became an emperor? Yes. On May the 18th, 1804, he became emperor of France and the coronation ceremony was held at Notre Dame on the 2nd of December. He was only 35 that year. He was really many things, but he was, first of all, a brilliant military leader. His soldiers were ready to die for him. Yes, he was really short, too. Of course, Napoleon had so many military victories, so his size wasn't an issue. You're right. At one time, he controlled most of Europe. Yes, but at that time, many countries, including England, Russia and Austria, fought fiercely against Napoleon. Right. His defeat came when he decided to attack Russia. In this military campaign in Russia, he lost most of his army. Shortly after his defeat, his abdication followed at Waterloo. And then he tried to escape to America, but he failed. He finally surrendered to the British government, and then they exiled him to St. Helena Island. I know his last years were spent there with a few chosen comrades. Uh, do you know how old he was when he died? He lived there until he died. He died in 1821 when he was only 51 years old. He died alone, deserted by his family and his friends. Well, that's a pretty sad way to end one's life. Well, Marty, I'm sure your presentation will be really good. You know, you could also give the chronological order of his life, and this may help your classmates to follow your presentation. Yes, that's a good suggestion. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. I have to go now. I have another lecture to attend. Good luck. Thank you. You've been really great help. I'm sorry that I can't come out with you this evening, but have a nice time. Bye. Bye. That's the end of section two. You will have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In section 3, you will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions 21 to 23 and complete the statements numbered 24 to 30 by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the talk and do questions 21 to 30. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange. Blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed 12 containers overboard. Inside the containers were 29,000 plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out and began to float across the Pacific Ocean. 
Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things, but it would be too expensive to drop twenty-nine thousand bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up in Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship. Some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship. Traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me, hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women, and children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii; others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington and Oregon. Can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So, if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So, keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. In this section, you will hear a talk about chocolate. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces numbered thirty-one to thirty-eight, and circle the appropriate letter for questions thirty-nine to forty. First, you will have thirty seconds to look at this section. Now listen to the talk and do questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Today my talk is going to be about chocolate. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of chocolate, but first I'm going to tell you a story about Julia Proctor. She eats her favorite food.
She feels guilty. She knows that chocolate has a lot of fat and sugar, but Julia says she is addicted to chocolate, and once she starts eating it, she can't stop. Julia isn't the only one who is addicted to chocolate. It is a favourite food for people all over the world, and in a survey of sixteen different countries, people preferred chocolate to ice cream, cakes, and cookies. In the United States, chocolate is a ten billion dollar industry. For Valentine's Day, for example, people spend over four hundred million dollars on chocolate. The idea of eating chocolate didn't begin until the nineteenth century. Before that, people drank chocolate. The custom began in Central America, where the Aztecs drank bowls of chocolate to stay alert. When the liquid chocolate was brought to Spain in the 1500s, people thought it was medicine because it tasted bitter like other medicines. In fact, the people who made chocolate into drinks were either druggists or doctors. Then people discovered that mixing chocolate with sugar made a wonderful drink. King Ferdinand of Spain loved this drink so much that he put out an order. Anyone who talked about chocolate outside the court would be killed. So, for about one hundred years, chocolate was a secret in Spain. But finally, people found out about chocolate, and it became a popular drink throughout Europe. In the eighteen hundreds, a British chocolate maker discovered a way to make chocolate smooth and velvety. Then the Swiss added milk to the chocolate. Today, most Americans prefer milk chocolate, while most Europeans prefer dark chocolate. Now, research shows that chocolate is actually good for us because chocolate has a variety of vitamins and minerals. And it has more than three hundred different chemicals. One chemical works on the part of the brain that feels pleasure. People who feel good when they eat chocolate are actually healthier, because feeling pleasure is important for health and can protect against illness. Good chocolate doesn't have much fat or sugar. You can enjoy it if you eat a little at a time. So. Thinking about Julia Proctor, who I mentioned at the beginning, if you just eat a little at a time, that isn't a big problem. That's the end of my talk on chocolate. That's the end of section four. You will have thirty seconds to check your answers.